quiet without me saying anything. That's fantastic. Welcome to part two or part one and a half. We are right on schedule late by two hours. That's fantastic. So we have the space for another 13 minutes. We'll try. No, no, it's okay. No, we have plenty of space. So we have. AI uh, and um, DAOs that try to buy an NBA team, people that are doing crazy stuff. We have Ricardo. So the second part is as exciting as the first part and a little bit more, I won't say technical, but definitely a little bit requires a little bit more focus. That means that if you want to talk with your colleagues or have fun or eat, please, please go all the way out and not go just outside because we can definitely hear you. So that's all. Let's have Constantina on stage. Thank you, Constantina. Thank you, Thank you, Constantina. Who's going to go? Ah, no. I'm looking. Ah, it's very good. Tellios, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Perfect. Ah, so, very Constantina, before, before you say what you're doing, say how we met. Who's this man? Who's this man? Uh, Lipon, I met John because, actually, I, I remember now. So I wanted to talk to John uh, for a couple of months. Couple, but of, couple of years. Couple of years. Months. Couple of years. <laughs> but he was so busy, I had messaged him in like all platforms. And then at some point, he finds an email I had sent him. And I was like, hey, John, just to bump this up your inbox, uh, we'd love to have a chat. Uh, and he replies, oh, yeah, I just had a baby, so I can chat now. <laughs> And he finally chatted with me, and yeah, that's how we met. And he was in LA, and I was in London. So the, the funny, the set. and uh, the funny thing is that she was in San Francisco when, yes. when you texted me, and when I responded, you were in London. Yes. And the interesting thing is that usually I try to respond to everybody on time, and I'm saying I'm saying the story right now because. When I saw that a Greek person was in San Francisco, that is so close to Los Angeles and everything, I wanted to connect to like, hey, there's network here, other people like, how can we help, how can we do everything? But sadly, she was in London. So I reached out and I'm like, let's have a call like next day, like immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I introduced, I made the intros, everything. Yeah, he made that for it, don't worry. Yeah, all so, good. So I'm saying this for the following reason, and we're saying this in the morning at the hackathon place, that a lot of Greeks want to help that are well, like in San Francisco, Los Angeles, they want to help people in Greece, but there are not many people in Greece that want to be helped, which is kind of strange and I don't know why. Um, and literally, like, I didn't know you before, we just sent an email and here we are right now. So I'm saying if, if you get anything from this discussion is that there are a lot of mentors, advisors in the US that want to help out, but be very careful also for scammers, people that are super lame, they think whatever. So do your due diligence and cold email people, like kind of works. Yeah, and from the other side, just do it. Just reach out to the people you think are interesting and you want to have a chat with, and this might happen. Yeah, that, like the downside is like minimum, minimal. Maybe they won't respond and that's it. And I will tell another story. Let me listen to the AI. Another story before saying the AI, it was maybe six, seven, eight years, I don't even remember anymore, that I was in San Francisco and uh, there were a lot of fans that were coming to Greece. And the uh, European Union was planning to give for the first time money to Greece to start a lot, a lot of venture capital funds, whatever. That was before Open Coffee. So before Open Coffee Fund, Open Fund. And so I was like super upset because I, I thought that like, People from the TV will get the funds and start funding their own companies. Okay, you know what? I'll start a fund that is called the Zero Fund. The Zero Fund was giving you zero money, but was getting zero equity, which was an amazing fund, but was giving you network. So we had people in our advisory board, the ex, uh, ex CTO of AOL, which was Greek, 15th generation Greek. Uh, the right hand man of Bill Gates, the guys that built Google Fiber, the guys from Amazon, they've got huge names because I just emailed them and I told them, I want to start a fund to help Greek people. I'm not going to give money, I'm not going to get equity. Can we just help them out? Long story short, we had a fund that ran and one company that made it to the fund, made it whatever, um, was Polfis that got acquired like a month ago for an insane amount. And the way that happened is that these guys, the, the mentors, start giving advice and network, 
and when Zero Fund ended, they're like, hey, how much, how many money, how much money you guys need? And they're like, Giannis was like, hey, I don't know, 300. And they're like, yeah, yeah, he's like 700. And let's see how it goes. And it kind of went. And again, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have a green card when I was in the US. Literally, I was called mainly Greek people or uh, 15th generation Greek people. And this is how it works. So after saying all that, doing a huge parenthesis, let's talk about AI and cold email people. Like, don't, don't forget about it. <laughs> let's do it. How did you end up? First of all, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, so what we're doing? We're doing KDIM. So KDIM is an AI startup. And essentially, we have developed machine learning algorithms that take 2D inputs, 2D art, sketches, concept art, and turn them into digital 3D objects. So those digital 3D objects can be used uh, to populate video games, movies, um, any digital experience, let's say. So that's what we're doing. And what's your connection with AI? Because as I've learned, a woman cannot be in AI, I you know, right? Yeah, like super strange. Like what's strong happening? Point. Yeah, yeah, what's up? Who is the guy behind the AI? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Um, so, connection with AI, essentially, I left Greece when I was 17 to go and study computer science. Um, I was in a class with 200 male computer scientists who were all playing video games in their free time. <laughs> and so, um, I started being interested in the intersection of art and technology. And I started doing 3D modeling myself during my, my degree. And uh, starting to try to recreate digital 3D experiences. And I found it so manual and so frustrating and so difficult to learn this super steep learning curve software. Actually, do you know what's funny? This is called the Blender gal Gallery. And for the people, app, it's called the Blender. The and for people who know, yeah, Blender is kind of like the most famous 3D software. And yeah, that's, that's a crazy way to see this. So to learn Blender, you need kind of like couples of like couple of years to become an expert. Um, and I didn't know that. So I, I started talking to game devs because I knew everyone was playing games and games had hundreds of thousands of 3D objects. And I was like, hi guys, how do you make those things? Like, what's your trick, right? There has to be a trick. Oh yeah. And they laughed at me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, you're so naive. Little girl, let me show you. <laughs> let me show you how we do let it. Let me educate you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The one's thing. Uh, and they show me around their, their studios and they end up in a huge room with like 60 3D artists who are all building every single concept, every single item from scratch, starting from a cube. Uh, to build any, a building, a car, it doesn't matter what it ends up, it all starts with a cube. Um, and I was like, no, there's no way. This is how it's done. So anyway, long story short, I did my master's on deep learning for 2D to 3D reconstruction. And KDIM was born during that master year before I graduated. Uh, and we won the startup competition, which allowed us to get going from my university, yeah. Interesting. So the story here is that... No man. No man. So the story here is that uh, miraculously, without having a man on the team, somehow you identified a problem, definitely a problem, like people were spending hours to build uh, a project, uh, a model, 3D model, and you're like, you know what, what if I can make it faster slash easier slash whatever? And what happened next? Like, did you raise money? Did you have any customers? I don't think you have ma customers because female founders... Also, yeah, 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 it's super hard to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the cold emailing front, um, I very early days, I was still finalizing my degree. I saw uh, Sean Layden, who is the ex-chairman of PlayStation, uh, who is a thought leader in the space, and he was describing how games have become completely unsustainable to make because of the huge bottleneck of 3D asset creation. And I cold emailed him. Oh. Started repeating, uh -huh. and uh, I said, "Son, oh my God, uh, I just have the same idea. I'm doing this project. I would love to get your opinion." And Son is one of our advisors right now, nice. just from a cold email. Cold email, cold email works. Cold email works. Uh, so yeah. So what happened early, early on? That was back in summer 2020 when I graduated, and KDIM became full time for me. Uh, we got the biggest amount of money from the competition I had seen in my life back then, 10,000. Oh, ten. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, it was a miracle back then. Uh, and then we managed to get uh, uh, the founder of Rebellion Games, who is, um, uh, let's say, the biggest gaming company in the UK, where we're based, and they're the makers of Sniper Elite, if you've heard of the game. Uh, so he was the first ever investor, and he put like 250K in alone. He did our whole round, I couldn't believe it. 
Um, and so we started building at this point. Like we said, okay, we have the prototype, let's now build it. I remember that uh, Tom Cruise told me once, who are you and what are you doing in my house? And this really stuck, stuck with me. So I have to ask you, after you raise the money mm. and you're like, oh shit, this is happening. Like, I'm a founder, this is working. And you start having customers. Did at any point you thought like, what's next or is the dream going to end or what's happening? Because me as a founder, whenever things are going too well, I expect things are going super bad, super fast. Did you went through this process at all? I mean, one bad thing about founders is that we never celebrate successes. Yeah, yeah. So I just got a huge customer and I would talk to the team, guys, we just got the biggest customer we had. And that was it. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, now let's solve the 200 bugs that we have in the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, so how, big, how big is your team? So we're now, now 17 people. Wow. Uh, some of this team is uh, remote, uh, kind of like all around the world because they do our quality control step for the AI. And the core team, all the engineers were in person in London. But you said, what happens after? And after you got the money? And the, the answer is mistakes ha started happening. That's wow. all, the only thing that happened. Good mistakes or mistakes? Bad mistakes. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, mistakes are good if you can learn from them. Yeah, yeah. So, Good mistakes because we learned from them and we pushed forward and we continued moving fast. But um, yeah, being a first time founder, oh boy, I made mistakes. Oh yeah, of course. So what do you That's think the about? Part. So the the objects that you create are they procedural generated? Meaning that the algorithm decides when you can you tell the algorithm I want a house and will create a house that the AI envisions it. Short answer, no. Um, so at KDM we focus on kind of like the um, um, accuracy. Mm -hmm. So when you sketch something and you sketch the house, then the algorithm will try to as closely match uh, your sketch. However, um, if you are not a 2D artist and you didn't create a sketch, you can very easily use a text to do the AI, which will imagine. So you can describe, you know, to Mid Journey or Dali. You can say whatever uh, a futuristic house with with a roof garden, whatever, mm -hmm. and it will create you some generative art, and then you can pass that to the output from those uh, text to do the AIs into KDIM to get your kind of like 3D version of it. Interesting. Interesting. Is anybody here that? has never heard about uh, images generated from AI? Anyone? So everybody has heard probably because what happened with the generated, uh, the generated images. So I want to ask like, so you have game companies that they're using your algorithms to make models faster. Do they use the actual models in the final game or they use them for prototyping, for beta versions, and then they dedicate resources? Both. Um, so okay. games, you can go anywhere from very low end, like mobile, which the quality doesn't have to be very high, actually. It cannot be high because of the technical uh, limitations. And then you can go up to console AAA. Mm -hmm. So our sweet spot, like as a company, uh, because we don't generate a huge amount of uh, detail and qualities, in mobile AR, VR, metaverse type of assets where essentially the models go into production. So they get, they form a very, very good starting point, say 80% done ah, okay. for each model. The artist will polish them and texture them because they come out from us without texture, but soon to be changed. Uh, and then get finalized and be put in the game. Now, when you go to very, very high end productions, like uh, AAA or even VFX for movies, then the assets can be used for prototyping, iteration, blocking out the scenes, because all of those people need to block out their scenes, see where things go, um, and help them to iterate. Mm, interesting. Uh, so I, have, I have a question. So you raise the money, everything, uh, you went to the investors, we're building this, it's the future, whatever. I remember when I was raising money, some investors, specifically from Europe, not from Greece, but from Europe, from Greece mostly, uh, they were saying, well, what if Google builds the same? Oh, and yeah. I think in your case, you should, probably you hear this many times, what if Google decides to do that? Yeah. So, I mean, um, that was the most recent one, I guess, but two or three years ago in my first fundraises, they were like, what? What is even that? Uh, who plays games? So that was two years ago. Okay. Two or three years ago. We overcame that. 
um, thank God. But now, yeah, it's like, um, what if um, a funk company like Facebook, Amazon, whatever, Apple, Google, builds that? And obviously, good investors don't ask this question. And yeah, yeah. my response to them is, okay, let's make the, the assumption of that a very big corporate will build, will have all of these innovative ideas and will make any new exciting product that can be made. If that assumption is true, then we wouldn't have startups. We have startups, so this assumption is not true. And, you know, if you have worked in a corporate or and can compare with a startup, you know how slow and kind of like excluding innovation the oh, environment yeah. is. And I think this is super important. Like, I've heard a lot of people asking, what if Google decides to do the same? First of all, it will take years. They will do all the mistakes, corporate thing. They will get crazy bonuses and probably it won't work as expected. But more importantly, bigger companies, they want to move fast, super fast. So instead of dedicating a team, finding a product manager, spending to R&D, usually they just acquire a startup and they just move way faster. Because the whole idea is that who's going to go faster in a market and expand, not who's going to save money. And this is sadly the mentality we Greeks have. How can we make, how can we save money instead of how can we make more money? Obviously, this happens because we're not like the US where we print money on our own. So this obviously is an issue. But this is something that we should definitely change. Like we should learn, we should try to figure out if I spend that much money, how much money would I make? Instead of like, how can I make this amount of money by not spending any money? Yeah, and the other side of it is uh, I see many founders saying, oh my God, I raised 3 million. How can I make it last five years? Oh, yeah. And I'm oh. like, what? How can you spend it in six months and make 10 million? Oh, yeah. And, and I think specifically investors, they, they want you. That's why they give you the money, because they want you to go fast. They want you to exit because they have to return money to their investors. So if you tell them these three years, these three million for 10 years, <laughs> Oh, we'll eat pizzas, we'll we'll stay in Greece, we'll be okay for 10 years. After that, we'll figure it out. But for 10 years, we are, we are, we are bro broke even, we are bre breaking even. So the thing that I've learned is that never say that we are going to break even. And I'm saying that because I had some discussions with some people that they told me, I have a business plan where I could break even in six months. I don't want you to break even in six months. I want you to go bankrupt in six months, months, months if your idea didn't work because investors exactly. put money, you put tons of energy, try to fail super fast. And if you don't fail, probably you'll go to the next stage and everything. Back to AI, sorry for... And the fail fast is the same for development, product development. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just build it, see if it works, uh, move to the next, see if they don't fail. But yeah, let's go back to AI. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I made this parenthesis because uh, Costadina is it's not only about AI, it's about female entrepreneurship, how to start something without having a big network. So it's not only about AI, the technical, but also how to make a business without being from Stanford, stay, living in San Francisco and having all the network available all the time. So yeah, that's, that's the, interesting, the interesting thing. So back to AI. Uh, why are you planning to also do animations or it's only static images? And how difficult is it to create an algorithm that goes from static to animation? In my mind, it's like trivia, like in a couple of days, like or something like that. But is it for our team? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, the creative process is very long and it starts from the concept art or even, you know, someone will describe the style of the game if we're talking about games and then someone will try and make sketches for it and then someone will try and make the 3D models and then the 3D models that are organic will have to be rigged and animated, etc, etc. There is uh, also the texturing side of things, yeah, yeah. there's how uh, scenes work together, there's the gameplay, the plot, like there's so many so things, many things. Yeah. that go, like, go into making a game. Now for Katie must Kadim, um, the super hard problem we're solving is the leap from 2D to 3D, which has not been solved. It's not a solved problem, and there's no company in the world that you can say, okay, yeah, they have done this research, let's use this research, and let's uh, kind of like build the product on top of it. So we have to kind of like innovate and make our own way of doing things. So this, if we manage to solve this, we're already uh, kind of like the industry leaders into AI for 2D to 3D. 
But for KDM, uh, rigging. So you, you mentioned the example of rigging. Rigging is not such a hard problem. Huh. Um, for example, a, an easy way to go about it would be, okay, let's make a, now I don't know, a library of a thousand rigs templates and one will be the rig of John, one will be uh, the rig of uh, I don't know, a bear and a bird, etc., etc. And then you can say, okay, this input looks like John. Let's apply John's template. Or this input looks like a bird. So let's apply it. So it's, it's not as hard of a problem to go around. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are very focused into solving the 2D to 3D. The hard problems. The hard problem. And then on our way, because this takes time, we are doing small upgrades. So for example, in a week we're going to launch texturing. Uh, so our customers can use KDIM for more and more of their pipeline. But our goal is definitely not going from zero to one in the gaming pipeline. So we want to do, the, let's say, 2D to 3D textured. And then, okay, go to product design, go to architecture, go to um, all of those other sectors, e-commerce, that want to turn all of their currently 2D digital experiences into 3D formats. And there's a huge uh, opportunity there. So we're already working, for example, with some e-commerce companies that are trying to turn all of their furniture into 3D to sell them, you know, online in a much, much friendlier selling format. Yeah. A lot of people here, I know definitely like more than 20 people here, specifically this guy there, they are in the data scientist, AI and everything. Do you have any suggestions how they could find a better paying job or what is the thing that is, what, what is the market out there? What is needed right now for people that they are in the, AI, in the AI sector or they are in the data science or engineering and they want to enter that space because I assume it's like the next big thing like Web3, Metaverse, AI and we'll talk a little bit about Metaverse and AI and how these like are joined in a, in a section but yeah, what do you think they should do? Come and talk to me. Ah, fantastic. So <laughs> if you're in the AI and everything, come and, come and talk to me. Uh, but okay, if you're, I mean, you said better paid job. So don't go to startups. <laughs> Uh, it depends kind of like what, what's your passion. Um, startups are all about moving super fast, learning super fast, and then kind of like uh, huge success potentially. Uh, but there are sacrifices. That's what I tell the people at the interviews. I'm like, do you really want to work at a startup? Are you an idiot? Do you want to work at a startup? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's your problem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, there's so many companies right now that are exploring uh, very smart ways to use AI to make products that are useful in the market and uh, London is okay on that front. In my opinion, London where we're based is the least worst place in Europe okay. to be uh, if you're doing kind of like tech startups and stuff like that. But obviously the place to be is the US and I'm really looking forward to spending more time there. Um, but yeah, currently in the startup ecosystem, there's so many new projects coming up with people using even ChatGPT. I've seen like three new startups the past month yeah, that yeah. are using ChatGPT to do dev tools or, you know, just very smart uh, content creation. Um, and there's, yeah, there's Jasper AI, there's Move AI, there's so many like interesting startups in the space. Oh, perfect. Um, do you have any metaverse comp companies that approach you and they're like, hey, want to do 3D objects? What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So metaverse is a huge one. And so that when I say to people what we do, I say for game and metaverse companies. And, like, and anyway, I think metaverse is a rebranding of uh, games. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, metaverse on the metaverse front, we have a, an also slightly different use case for our tech, which has to do with UGC, which is user-generated content. Yeah, yeah. And so the idea is that you know everyone can be a part of a metaverse, and ideally everyone should be able to contribute to a metaverse as well, and you know create content and populate this world that we're sharing, digital world. And so uh, we're working with companies right now that want to allow. Uh, those end users, the players, the users of the metaverse, to be able to create by just submitting an image, converting it with KDIM into a digital object, and then that way being able to be part of the creation. So it's the UGC side as well. But yeah, a lot of metaverse companies. And to Halasa, to Halasa, to Halasa. Makute, makute. Aye. To Halasa, poli grigora. After the point, ora. Let me restart the microphone. Oh, no. Oh, the battery is almost dead. Fantastic. So, 
Ah, that's me too, Ana. So, when we say about metaverse, and I know it's already almost 4 o'clock, 3.30, we haven't talked about metaverse, and we'll, we'll talk more, it's very strange. That's the meta part of the metaverse. We don't talk about metaverse if you are in the metaverse. So the metaverse, as we said, is an alternative reality with different rules, different ideas, different everything. This is now is a metaverse because things we are learning things of a different reality. Some people is a different reality because it's startups, different reality because AI. But in general, as companies envision and they try to do a metaverse, is they want to add things on the existing reality so people could understand it before going crazy and creating avatar or whatever which is a total different reality for example and this example i give always to people and they get it immediately is uh, nike or nike as we call him call them in greece uh, what they do is they're going to release an augmented reality headset here like glasses and you're going out for a run and you will be able to see yourself how you run in the past. So you see the, the ghost runner running in front of you. So you're trying to, you know, go faster. And then you will be able to see ghost runner of your friends that are running around. And then while you're running around Athens, you will see a huge 3D, 3D object above Acropolis. It might be an ad, might be a well done. And when you do the Acropolis, the marathon, for example, you might see fireworks when you finish or stuff like that. So it's, they augmented your reality. You start with useful information, like you're running, here's your heart rate, all this stuff. And then they start erasing your reality and they will offer you a full, re, a full fake alternative experience. For example, they're going to release shoes. They already bought a Los Angeles company that created NFT shoes and you will be able to buy NFT shoes to run in their total virtual, virtual environment. And I know that now it sounds super stupid. Why would I buy fake shoes? Next year, we're having the next via the metaverse. Everybody will have fake shoes, I guarantee you. So it is going to happen. I guess they, they are uh, doubling down on gamification of everything. Like, exactly. let's make, uh, how would you run in a video game? Let's now make you run like that and get all of that gratification of winning. Exactly. Uh, by running, actually running. Oh yeah, and that's why the metaverse is a huge deal. Because the companies, all big companies are like, Huh, I would be able to sell digital nothing for actual money. <laughs> Amazing. I don't need to make shoes, but you will buy shoes. I don't need to make, you know, actual physical items. You will buy the digital items. Everybody still happy. need to make the 3D model of the shoe. And that's where I was going to. So you need to make the 3D model, so you make the tools for, for the companies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. KDM is in a good future. In a very good, very good space. Uh, do we have any questions about... What we discussed, anything? No questions. We were so clear. So clear, crystal clear. Perfect. Okay, I think that's, that's all. all. Fantastic, because we have another 50. No, no, we have like more, <laughs> more talks. So thank you, Costadina. Thank Let's you, Costadina. <laughs> And 